in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In addition to being the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, today is the feast of St. Louis, the King of France. In our age of moral turpitude, the idea of a saint king seems nearly impossible. In fact, by our standards, it would seem that those who are born to wealth and to power are practically expected to be immoral. But St. Louis lived in a completely different age. St. Louis lived in an age when Christ reigned in society. He reigned in the middle of the 13th century, which was the pinnacle of Christian civilization. He knew St. Thomas Aquinas, and there were many other saints in both France and Italy and Germany and England alive at that time. And more important than that, society was ordered. Christ was the king of society. This reign of Christ in society was established by the Emperor Constantine in the early 300s. And it grew stronger gradually with the passage of time until the law of Christ and of his church was the law of the land. And the first law of the land was that the nation profess the Holy Catholic faith true Christianity. The ruler in the 13th century was someone who had as his first duty the protection of the Catholic faith in the realm. And this was mentioned in his oath of coronation. And he was made the king in a sacred ceremony, similar to the consecration of a bishop, in which he was anointed with the holy oil to be the true representative of Christ the King in society. And the King of France had the special privilege of singing the gospel at the, at the solemn mass, putting on a dalmatic and singing the gospel because it was his duty, almost as much as it was the duty of the bishops of his realm, to preach the Holy Gospel and to protect it. The idea of a saint king, therefore, in the 13th century, was not something foreign to the minds of contemporary society, but rather was an ideal that was to be achieved. And sanctity was not something unheard of in rulers. St. Edward the Confessor at a much earlier time in England, King Louis VII, who although not a saint, was a very pious man, a predecessor of Louis IX, whose feast we celebrate. St. Wenceslaus, the St. Henry, the Emperor of Germany, St. Ferdinand of Spain, and many, many others, St. Elizabeth of Hungary, St. Elizabeth of Portugal. This was an ideal because of the high calling of the monarch. He should be a saint. Also, it was this reign of Christ in society that produced a St. Louis. The production of, this, of a saint is the work of the grace of God. But God gives grace not only interiorly, 
by the movement of the faculties of the soul, but also exteriorly. Right now, you are receiving an exterior grace. That is the preaching of a sermon. The good example of the clergy is an exterior grace. The proper raising that you get as a child in a pious Catholic family is an exterior grace. And the ordinary way of God is to produce saints from families that have exterior graces and by extension from societies in which these virtues are esteemed. In the society of the 13th century, the virtues of St. Louis were highly esteemed. If St. Louis were elected the President of the United States today, he would be considered a scoundrel for the very same virtues. And so what produced or helped to produce St. Louis was the fact that society was behind him. His mother said, I would sooner see you dead than to have committed a single mortal sin. How many mothers say that? Overcoming all of the instincts of motherhood, ceding to grace that God must be loved above all things and she would sooner see her little baby dead than that he commit a single mortal sin. So part of the sanctification of your soul by God is the family into which you are born and the nation as well into which you are born and how you are raised. It is rare that God make a saint <clears throat> out of someone who does not have a pious background. Yes, there, there are the St. Augustines and the other saints who live sinful lives in their youth. But they are rare. Usually the saints come from very pious homes and from pious societies. And if we complain today that we see the number of saints going down, and certainly we do, it is because society has defected from our Lord Jesus Christ. The reign of Christ in society was destroyed in the 18th century by the American Constitution and by the French Revolution. The Constitution of the United States in 1789 marked the first time in the history of the world in which a nation was indifferent to religion. Never before had that been true. And when Thomas Jefferson suggested that the nation be indifferent to religion, the Protestants said to him, you are an atheist. To suggest such a thing, that this nation should be indifferent to religion, that there should be no establishment of religion in this new nation. They said, you're an atheist. Yet, nonetheless, such a scandalous thing occurred. And simultaneously in France, France, that nation which had been founded by bishops, France in 1789 apostatized by her revolution and had an influence throughout the whole world, particularly the Catholic world. And shortly thereafter, every single nation in which the Catholic faith was established and in which Christ reigned apostatized the nations of Europe and, her, and all of the colonies of Europe, including South America and Mexico and Canada. 
until by the end of the 19th century, a mere hundred years, the idea that a secularized society in which religion has no part is the norm, is something that should be. It is a great ideal to be achieved. The idea of an indifferent state, a state without a religion, a state in which Christ is dethroned, was much touted by the Freemasons and by free thinkers in the 18th century, such as Voltaire, Rousseau, Benjamin Franklin, and others who were godless people and who led utterly debauched lives. One could not mention from the pulpit the filth of some of these people. And it makes the filth of diverse political personalities in the recent past look like nothing. The Freemasonic thinking has led the modern world to believe that freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press are wonderful things and should be safeguarded by society. These freedoms were proposed by Freemasons who were anointed to undo Catholic society, to bring it down. These freedoms were proposed and promoted by them for the very purpose of destroying the reign of Christ in society and for destroying the, even the remnants of Christianity in society. Now, although when I say these three things, because of the influence of Freemasonry, most of you say, oh yes, these are wonderful things. Do you know that they were condemned by Gregory the Sixteenth and by Pius the Ninth and by Leo the Thirteenth and by Pius the Tenth and by Pius the Eleventh? Do you know that? Leo the Thirteenth said, if you have these freedoms, you are going to destroy society. That people will listen to every sort of error and that there will be a multiplication of all kinds of depravity. He said that over a hundred years ago. And look at what has happened. He was right. Because when these things were touted and promoted, people still had a hangover of Christianity. They still had certain inhibitions. They still had a certain piety. But because of the gnawing, like rats, of these freedoms, so-called, on the, the morality of people, look at our society today. These freedoms have given us the culture of godlessness, of debauchery, of blasphemy, of birth control and abortion. They have given us the destruction of the family and have even given us Vatican II, the destruction of our church. You recently recall there was a big controversy about under God, that that should not be in the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, I tell you, and it might shock you, I agree with that. Because there is nothing in the Constitution of this nation, nothing in its laws, that says that we are under God. And I believe that it is a lie to say that we are. How can you say that a nation that has, by its laws, by its permission, by its legality, has permitted the destruction of 40 million babies since 1973, 40 million which makes the exterminations of Nazi Germany pale. How could you say that such a nation is under God? 
This is not under the devil. And how could you say that a nation that permits the crushing of a baby's head as it is presenting itself in the birth canal to be born, the crushing of its head and the removal, the dismemberment of such a child, a little baby, is under God. How could anyone say that? It is an insult to God to say under God when that is legal. Infanticide, the killing of babies. Yet, this is given to us by freedom of religion. For who is to say that is a baby? Who is to say that is a life? What law? What God? Many popes, as I said, condemn these freedoms. Yet they are very cherished by the modern world. But they are contrary to the royalty of Christ. St. Louis would have condemned such a thing. For he would have wisely understood that given original sin, these freedoms would bring men to live under, the men that live under them, would bring them to the basest degradation of their minds and souls. This is what has happened. Look at your television sets. Look at your movies. The basest degradation of human mind and soul. There was something shocking to us a few years ago in New York. Elephant dung was placed upon the picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Brooklyn Museum. An outrage. And indeed it was. But what is the difference between that and the freedom to say Our Lady is not a virgin, the freedom to deny dogmas concerning the Mother of God, is that not the same thing as placing dung in her image? Or the freedom to say that Christ is not God, as the Jews and the Muslims say, is that not to throw dung at Christ? And what was cited in defense of the elephant dung picture? Freedom of speech. And who was to deny it? And it's the same freedom of speech that has permitted movies to be made in which our Blessed Lady is portrayed as a harlot. Or our Blessed Lord is a womanizer or worse. Same freedom of speech. Is that not dung on the image of Christ and of our Blessed Lady? And yet it is guaranteed, a guaranteed freedom. We will not see in our lifetimes the reign of Christ in society, but we must always strive for it. Let us not be good Freemasons, but let us be good Catholics. Let us have an interior that is Catholic, attitudes that are Catholic, the way St. Louis would have. If St. Louis came into our society today and looked around, he would say to, your, to you Catholics, what are you doing? Are you filled up with these ideas? Do you think this is a good society in which you live? But many Catholics, unfortunately, are filled with the ideas of the godless and debauched Freemasons of the 18th century. And they have lost their Catholic attitudes, and the only thing left Catholic in them is their piety. And if we cannot make Christ reign in our society, we can make him reign in our families. That is still our sanctuary, and we can ban the influence of the modern world, which is godless, which is liberal and which has succumbed to the effects of this moral degradation. We can ban that from our homes, 
But many of you have not. Many of you invited in willingly the sewer pipe into the living room. And you have lost your Catholic sense and your Catholic culture. What produces saints. And also, finally, you must prepare to suffer. Generously and valiantly. If you are Catholic in this world, you must suffer. You must give up many of the riches and the pleasures and delights of this world. You must give up job opportunities, which lead you into immorality. You must put up with a lot of different problems, where to send your children to school. A lot of economic problems, as the Irish did under the penal laws of the English where they couldn't even get a schooling, even though they were intelligent, and where they had to sell their horse to an Englishman if he would offer him five pounds. That was the law in Ireland. And they lived under them. And England, English people, too, in England, lived under the penal laws because they lived in a society in which error was established. So we must live under our own penal laws, self-imposed, because we cannot give in to the modern Freemasonic society which denies the royalty of Christ. St. Louis was captured in the Crusades by the Muslims, and he had a coin struck in France showing himself in chains because he said there is no greater honor for a Christian than to suffer for our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.